Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me well? Okay, cool. Uh, so a few pieces of context before we get started. Uh, one, you guys are already farther ahead than me. I wasn't allowed in these classes. I didn't make it to the business school. I uh, wasn't great at BYU, but I made it out of school. We're going to talk about some successes today. Second, I've had a lot of failed startups. Uh, we won't cover all of those today. I will cover some of the reasons my prior ones failed, but this is definitely wasn't my first swing. Uh, so, you know, again, we'll talk about some of the things we've done well and some of the things we haven't. Uh, but as an entrepreneur, like expect and wait for failure because it's coming. Uh, and Scott, uh, I was on a plane with him to California a couple weeks ago, and he didn't invite me to play Pebble Beach with him, so I was pretty frustrated. But next time he says I can go. Next time I should. Next time he goes to Pebble, I'm there. Um, all right, so we've got 30-ish, 40-ish minutes that we're going to go through stuff. I'm largely going to tell you a little bit about how Divi got off the ground, the things in the, that we had to go through, the entrepreneurship stories. There will be a lot of interaction. We will do a more formal Q&A at 4.30 in the seventh floor, something like that. Um, but I will ask for a lot of uh, questions and, and happy to answer stuff as we go through. So who knows what Divi is, by the way? Just like raise your hands. Not that many. Okay. Oh, oh, I was like, well, someone's here, but Maddie works there, so that doesn't count. Um, who knows that we have a FinTech uh, internship for, for accounting and entrepreneurship students here at BYU? All right. We'll get you guys that information because we are recruiting heavily here at BYU. One of the reasons my partner and I, Blake, Is it going right? There we go. Um, my partner and I, Blake, are from Seattle. Uh, we're born and raised in Redmond, Washington, which is uh, Microsoft country. But we were born there when it was like an actual cow town. Um, we're both twins, born in the same month, and we've been friends since like fourth grade. So uh, it's been quite a, quite a journey to, to, to build uh, Divi up with Blake. Um, so we started in 2016. Four years ago to this month, Blake uh, called me and he said, hey, uh, I just moved back from Seattle. I was living here in Utah and I moved back here because honestly, there's not a better place to start a company in, in America than here. The talent, the intelligence, the grind, the integrity, uh, a lot of the things that you get here and the affordability. It's just it's easier to live here than it is San Francisco and Seattle. So I moved here uh, back to Orem because I was excited to get back into tech and start a company. So Blake calls me, um, and he fundamentally, he's running his companies, right? He's got five pizza studios. Have you guys ever eaten a pizza studio? It's marginally okay pizza, so I like to tell Blake. Uh, so he had five pizza studios, and he had this problem. The problem was is like p restaurants are super thin margin, and if someone gives you an expense like too late, so let's say it's February, and they hand you a report for what they spent in December, which is super common, and that's a $4,000 reimbursement, that ruins like your whole month. So not only do you have to report back to your board, you have to start like telling your investors you're not profitable, you missed the margin that you thought, and it's all because you didn't see your expenses at the right time. So the whole idea that we had to start right back here in February was why can't we just like see everything right now, right? Like we have iPhones, why can't we just swipe a card? And actually at the time we wanted to use our iPhone and, and pay with it, and we're like there's got to be a way. Um, so that was like our initial concept was to say, we can run our companies more efficiently and we can create this Venmo for business like experience in which every swipe shows up. So that was like our, our big wow experience or our big like thought process. But from this moment when we were super excited it happened to my basement that we were like gonna go launch this, we spent the next six months talking about it. What I mean by talking about it, because this was not a small investment, we designed it. Have you guys used Envision? Actually, hold on, let's back up. Who's actually started a company before? Who has, who's, has plans to start it in the next like 12 months or so? And who wants to start a company for sure you know, down the road? Awesome. Um, Envision will be one of your best friends. And if you don't know what it is, it's a software that allows you to just mock up uh, designs and software. So we basically used Envision. We mocked it up. And we started showing everyone we know. Who do you think is the first people that we showed? If you had an idea, who would you show first? Family. Who? Family. Family. Someone said mom. Who said mom? Worst idea ever. <laughs> Why? She's going to love it. She's going to say it's the greatest idea. Even if it sucks, she's going to say it's great. Don't show your mom. 
You're going to show Peterson? Yeah. That's a solid. Uh, he's, he'll give you fair advice. Have you told people their ideas aren't good? And I tell you all the time that their ideas, I can't even use the word. Yeah, they're not yeah good. you'd get kicked out of BYU. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so don't tell your mom. Uh, what about, let's talk about uh, friends. What about friends? Are they good people to talk to you about your idea? Why, why no? I heard some over here. They're biased. Any other thoughts? Don't want to hurt your feelings. They're your friends. They want to stay friends. Uh, yeah? They're not necessarily your customer. They're not necessarily your customer. So I think it can be okay to practice your pitch on your friends, right? Like you don't not tell your friends you want a go idea, but don't take their validation as like as success. You're not a millionaire yet, right? So they're not always your customer. Uh, I heard someone in the class before us was talking about property management solutions. And if you tell your friends that are in college with you, like they don't know how to manage a ton of property management. We sell to CFOs. I can't necessarily like tell a friend and for him to uh, totally get it and understand. So you have to be careful when you get this idea who you're going to tell. Obviously, we told our parents. They thought it was great. We told our friends. They thought it was great. But that didn't mean anything to us. So what we ended up doing is we said, OK, we have these mock-ups, these designs. We have a pitch. And we're going to start calling people that we don't know, uh, LinkedIn, emails, friends of friends, um, people in the right position, bankers. And we're just like, we're going to start pitching it. We're going to start pitching. We're going to see what happens. And I'm going to walk you through some of the highs and lows of those pitches. But it took another 18 months uh, for us to get to market, and which is also ridiculous because in uh, September of 2016, we had hired a crew. We had about 10 people. We're like, we're ready. Let's go. And we thought we could be live in January. Well, we were right, just the wrong January. It was a whole other year, uh, and we'll get to some of that as well. Lots, a lot of pitfalls as we got there. So we eventually launched product 2018, and we're um, two years from that, and it's been uh, it's been pretty pretty crazy, pretty fun. Okay, let's go into some of the early pivots. Um, this isn't like a Twitter pivot. We didn't entirely change our model to become this thing we didn't know exist. But do you guys know what virtual cards are? Who who know, who is it? Yeah, what's a virtual card? Yeah, so it's not your actual physical card that's on your phone or that's in your wallet. It's like a new 16-digit number that appears on your phone and you can either tap to pay or you can send it online and, and, and buy something online. Blake and I, my partner, uh, we had never heard of virtual cards. So when we were coming up with this really cool fintech ecosystem, we uh, worked with US Bank. They were our group that we were going to work with. And they, they, sent over, um, they sent over the contract. And there was two things that they sent us that we were like, it was one of those like, oh, OK. One, we didn't know that Interchange existed. And we didn't know about virtual cards. Interchange, for those that don't know, if you go to Target, you swipe for $100. The bank's going to get about $2, $2.50 of that. That's Interchange. So they were going to pay us to use their product which we're like, oh, wow, that's great. Uh, we thought we were going to pay them. Second thing is virtual cards. Virtual cards is the, probably one of the biggest aspects of our system, and we'll get into some of that later. But it was super impactful that we didn't know everything when we started. We knew we had a problem, which was expenses coming in too late. And we were going to solve that problem. But as we solved that problem, a lot of things came to our advantage uh, and allowed us to pivot in a spot that was, that was really cool. Ha do you guys use Apple Pay or Samsung Pay with your phone? So we thought in 2016 that like everyone would be as cool and as smart as you guys, but then you start realizing we're selling to like 55-year-old controllers, and they don't even have an iPhone. So we actually there was this time in October 2016. Uh, it was a Friday. We thought we were going to shut the company down because we couldn't just use Apple Pay. That was our entire vision. Our entire vision was like Apple Pay and Venmo combined, and we would have this billion-dollar idea. And we realized that one of those ideas was gone. We couldn't use Apple Pay. And it's because what happens when you go to a restaurant? Can you use Apple Pay if you have a waiter? Are you going to take your phone and then bring it back? Like, that would never work. And we had all these instances where we're like, dang it. Like, we thought we had this. We'd raise money. We'd raise $10 million. $10 million. We had 20 people on our staff at this point. We th and we were like, we're off to the races. And then we figure out that we're kind of screwed. Everything that we thought was going to happen was not actually going to happen. And actually, it's, it's one of those uh, testaments of, you know, if you guys heard the comment or the, the, 
the phrase, like, you have to be crazy to start a company. What they mean by that is, like, you have to be kind of crazy stupid and crazy naive. And, and when this happened in October, we were kind of naive because we were like, one, we were naive that everyone was going to use Apple Pay. That was dumb. We were also naive that we thought, um, well, fine, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just solve it. It's like, well, just solving it, you have to change our entire platform. All of our designs had to be changed. The way that we'd send money to each other had to be changed. There's a lot of lessons that we learned that, like, when something goes so, so bad, it was a Friday night. We literally were like, Blake and I, you know, kind of the company meeting. We go home. We're on the phone driving home in traffic, and we're like, well, is it over? And it's like, yeah, yeah I don't know how we get around this. Go to sleep. By the next morning, you're solving it. And that is what an entrepreneurship is like. You're constantly, like, in the past month, I've probably had seven things come to my desk or, you know, to my brain space that has been like, how are you going to solve this? Is there a way around it? And frankly, you kind of have to be dumb enough to keep going and keep going. All right. Uh, product redesign. So um, we'll come back to this, actually. <coughs> Highs and lows. I want to start with this bottom one. So we talked about selling your product to your friends and family. Uh, when you get out past your friends, what are ways that you guys would think, like, suggest you have product market fit? What would you do? What would you be looking for to tell yourself? You call someone up. They don't, they don't, they're not your mom. They're not your friend. And you're starting to, to, would you sell them something? Would you get them to sign something? How would you, how would you evaluate product market fit? Any ideas? Come on. You guys, you have ideas. You want to be entrepreneurs? Like, how would you figure out if, if you're onto something? What would they? What would you be asking for? You're pitching. You're pitching Scott. You're asking him for five hundred thousand dollars. What? What are you looking like? What are you looking for? What are you asking him to do? How do you know that you have something? Okay, you're looking for pain points. How are you going to get that? You don't have anything to sell him. Okay. So you're going to put your business on the line with body language. I'm. Um, that's a question. Okay. Okay, I like it. So remember, you're coming to someone to say, will you buy my product I don't have? And then you, you're, are you looking for them to ask questions or are you asking questions? You're going to ask them good questions. Okay, anyone else? Any other thoughts on this? You were right, by the way. Body language is one of the answers. Like, this is what I'm going to go into. So body language. Uh, there's more than one way. But like constantly, people say, like, well, I have this business. I had a friend call me actually two weeks ago. He said, Alex, I have this business idea. So it's going through his business idea. And immediately, I realized I'm his friend. And I realized, like, I actually don't want to give real business advice. And the second that I realized that, it's over. Like, I don't really have much to add to him because I'm not giving him real, honest business advice. So then last week, another friend called me and he said, hey, I have an idea. And I said, hey, before we have this conversation, Am I allowed to not be your friend and give you real honest business advice? And he goes, yes, that's what I want. And I go, are you sure? I want to double check because if we're going to have this conversation, I want to make sure that I can give you like honest business advice. And he's going to go, yes. So then we sat down. He told me his idea. Don't love it. So I was like, hey, man, don't love it. We looked at his economics. And it was like I was able to be free and to, and to give him real advice. But what happened here is this. When we came and started pitching people Divi, there was like, they would, inter we would record all of our demos. I probably did like 200 demos at this point, maybe more. And we would get people to, they would interrupt me and they would say like, hold on. Can you go, what'd you just say? You can create budgets in which if people spend at the same time, it just dynamically tells everyone what's going on so I don't have to wait for an expense report. I'm like, yeah. They're like, okay, wow. All right, yeah, I get it. Wh when is this available? How much is it gonna cost? They would say, wow out loud. It wasn't just like leaning forward, putting their hand on their chest. You have a question? My energy, my enthusiasm was finally transferred to them in a way that they understood the vision that, I, that Blake and I were trying to convey. It took a while. We had to get better at it, but I was finally able to get them to the same epiphany that we had when we started it. And that was why they stopped the conversations and they'd say something to the effect of like, wow, that's amazing. Holy cow, I can't get that anywhere else. When is it available? How much does it cost? So another thing I would say, if you're looking at starting a company, I'd say, all right, how much is it going to cost? Hey, I don't have the product right now, but I want to charge you $50 a month. If I charge you $50 a month, is that, would you buy that? 
oh, that seems a bit much. Like, ask them. Sell, sell them. They, they're going to say no, but it's a, it's a really good practice for people that want to be entrepreneurs to, to go through that process. We went through that, uh, and it was that was when we realized we had something. This was before we raised funds. We did our mock-ups, got, went through that process, and those wows and those amazings was the reason we were like, all right, let's be stupid. Let's quit our jobs. Let's go. Okay, um, meetings with U.S. Bank. Well, it is stupid, which we'll get into that later, too. Hey, so anyone ever, anyone else, anyone met with a banker and just walked out of that room and said that was the best meeting of my life? <laughs> no? Okay, well, that's me. I actually have that experience. My partner, Blake, and I, we went there. We went to um, Minneapolis, went to U.S. Bank, met in one of their big corporate rooms, looking over the city, and we're sitting there, and we make this pitch, and we get through, you know, we, we're getting these, we're getting wows. And what we realized is, like, there's a room full of, like, senior VPs and executives. These guys are making, like, a million dollars a year, $500,000 a year, making decisions, and they are eating up what we're saying. They're 20 to 30-year veterans, and they love what we're saying. And we just left that room realizing, like, it's a new generation. Like, these banks have no idea how to build powerful software. They are not Steve Jobs. Like, they are fundamentally flawed. Uh, as entrepreneurs, you guys are aware that Clayton Christensen died recently, yeah? Yes. You, have you read or heard his book, Innovator's Dilemma? Or, is that the title? Yeah. Yep. Uh, banks are like the epitome of this. They're elephants. They're not nimble. They're not running around. They are elephants waiting to be eaten. So this was, uh, this was an opportunity. We walked out of there. We were on cloud nine. We thought everything had been fixed. Um, now, I'm going to go to the low because uh, that's over here. So we had this high, we, we started with uh, US Bank, so great. We thought we'd solved everything. We got a call a year later. So we've been at this for a year, we'd spent millions of dollars, we have 30 people on our staff. And to hire someone on your staff, by the way, that is not a founder, like Blake and I both knew what we were doing when we got into this, but to hire employees and, and know that they have a house and kids and like a wife that they're taking care of, like that, there's a fair amount of responsibility there. And we got a call from a mid-level mid -level compliance manager, didn't even know us, and they shut us down. It was over. It was literally just like, hey, sorry, but we can't let Divi proceed. And it was a death nail. We had no backup plan. I just remember sitting in Blake's office. This was the door, and we're looking out the glass windows, and we're just like, what are we supposed to say? Like, what are you supposed to say to someone when you're like, it's over, I don't know the answer? Well, uh, you know, we get into our answers. We ultimately, like, rolled up our sleeves, flew out to banks the next week and figured something out. But it was, like, a week of just that stress inside of you of, like, how am I going to solve this? So there are some serious lows when you're on this ride of entrepreneurship where things happen and, and it's uh, out of your control. We couldn't call them. We couldn't try to co coerce them. It was like, nope, bank, government, shut us down. Okay, another time, right? Uh, you're talking about roller coasters. This is just our story here at Divi. Um, Blake and I, if it was Blake and I, we're both non-techies, who do you guys think we should hire first? Who would be our first hire? Tech guy, Tech guy CTO. Who's our second hire? CFO. CFO, any other ideas? Sorry, product. That would have been a good idea. Product. We hired a marketing guy. A CMO, super successful, super smart guy. I won't name his name because he deserves, like, we put him in the bad position. It was apparent within, like, three weeks. We're like, what is he doing here? We don't have a product. We're a year out. We're not close. Like, and we realized we made the mistake. This isn't him. We made the mistake. We hired C-levels. We hired people that, it, that had resources and they had staffs. And they, that's what the, that was their skill set, not building. That was a huge mistake by Blake and I. We own it. We had to look those people in the eye and say, hey, thank you so much for joining us on this crazy dream, but like, th you have to go. And it sucked. And there was days, like we actually, after, after the US bank thing, we, had to, we looked at our finances and realized we couldn't just hire everyone. 30 people out there, and we, we knew 10 had to go. We didn't know what 10, we knew 10 had to go because we knew the payroll. And so you're looking at like, if you three are friends, you're like, well, you're fired, but I really need you to stay, even though you're best friends with him, and we haven't decided on you yet, right? It was a lot of, like, it's really, really difficult. Um, 
And my own point of even like talking about this story is like one, a lot of times like Diddy is growing fast, it is going well, but like please don't think it has always been easy and please don't think your journey will be easy or if it comes to a failure point that you've actually failed. You're just at the point what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur and you really have to grind through it. So, okay. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so what was our approach to meeting with banks was the question. There's really, uh, there's like three types of banks. So you have the big boys, everything, you're, you know, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, U.S. Bank, there's the big guys. Then there's what's called super regional, regionals, which would be like Zions Bank, well known here, but in the East Coast, they've never heard of them. Then there's community banks, which is like, a small community bank in Chattanooga, Tennessee, right? Those are the three levels. Blake had been working with U.S. Bank. We called some community banks, and largely we just started dialing. Like, honestly, it was pretty, we just picked up the phone, figured out who would respond, called people we knew in the industry, got some meetings. We probably met with like 10 to 20. Um, we didn't really have any rhyme or reason. We've realized now the big banks, they're really, really hard to work with. Like they have so much money to lose and that all, they have all the motivation in the world to just not take a risk. So they don't. The community banks are too small. Not enough resources to make it happen. So we spent our time in the, in the regional banks. It's like one to 10 billion in assets is, is too small. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. Uh, US, uh, US Bank was shut down by the government. There was a lot of compliance and regulation. They didn't want to outsource the creating of a card because there's some uh, legal uh, ramifications to that. So the, the compliance group at US Bank shut down Amazon on a certain project, and Divi was just like an afterthought. Like they didn't care. It was a bigger government uh, fraud. A lot of regulation. Like if they don't comply, they get sued for a bunch of money. So that's what shut us down. At US Bank, we went somewhere else, obviously. Okay. Uh, any other questions? If not, we're going to keep going. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so think about your own startups, either the, that you've done or you've worked at or you want to do in the future. This was something that we learned, right? So you've heard of the 10x rule, like your product has to be 10x better for it to get traction. With us, we learned this, that you have two strategies. And for us, price was one. Who are the expense report players? Does anyone know? You guys are in college, so it's not as annoying. Once you get in the workforce, you'll hate them. But anyone heard of Concur? Expensify, Certify, these are the guys we play, We were going up against. Their pricing was 10 to $20 per user per month, okay? So that was our pricing. Uh, and we said to ourselves, we have to innovate here. If we don't innovate, if we try to go to market at their price point, we'll lose. They already have all the software, they have all the relationships. Why would someone leave them to come to us? So we had to figure out price. Second thing was software. Fortunately, that they, co uh, they uh, came together. One, does anyone know how much Divi costs? Free. Have you seen the billboards, or how do you guys know that? Guess. Just guess? Okay. Do you know how we make money? Bank fees, interchange, all, all the above, yep. So when you use your Wells Fargo bank, they typically don't charge you like a SaaS fee, right? It's just fees on the back end. We make money from lending, make money on interchange. Um, but we obviously didn't invent interchange. How come the incumbents didn't do this? How were we in a spot to innovate Chase Bank and Amex and Wells and Concur and, and, and uh, Expensify? Yeah. Yeah, so that, you're right. Why, though? Like, what, makes, what, what made it so that we were, uh, we were agile and they weren't? Because this is important for you guys as you think about like, hey, I want to enter a market. I want to do property management. I want to do whatever. It's like, well, think about your market. Because you know what question my dad would give me when he's like, you're leaving your job? Or my wife would give me? Or my brother? They would say like, why, do, why, why don't they do it? They have billions of dollars. You're going to raise a couple million and think you can go solve this? Why? Well, that's coming. What? Yeah, low fixed and variable cost, that's right. Think about banking. What do you think happened, uh, I don't know, give or take 10 years ago? Do you guys remember what happened? How old are you guys? Okay, 20, well, 27 should remember, like 
system. But there was a fairly big recession that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, like a lot of regulation and stuff, so they were giving away credit. So the banks clamped down. And what this means is that the CEO of the bank has someone as, as equally as powerful as him, and it's the chief risk officer. The CEO cannot tell the chief risk officer what to do. They are, they are literally built to slow down, right? That's actually pretty powerful. That worked in our advantage where they couldn't say, oh, there's the, the tides are changing, let's make an investment. They can't because they have a risk officer who says, nope, don't want to. So that was, that was like our whale, or the, the elephant couldn't move fast enough when we were the, the mice running around, is that we could say, well, hold on. We don't have legacy systems like Scott said. Concur was built in 95. We're building it now, so we could do the card, your Amex card, and concur and just build it onto one platform. And that's what allowed us to, uh, to go to market in a way that, that they didn't and say, well, we'll just give up the $10 a monthly fee. And that was big enough reason for people to say, I'll come, you know, let me, let me come try it out. Second thing, though, was not just price, it was software. So when we say <coughs> all-in-one real-time and credit, Real time was that a that thing at the beginning with Expensify, you couldn't see expenses. Do you think it's easy to build up a, a credit facility, like a credit arm at a bank? Because I thought it was actually pretty easy. I thought everyone did it. And then when we started to do it, we realized it was going to cost us a few million dollars, a lot of people, and, a, and another six months to build credit. We could have done it much, much faster launching on a debit card. Why do you think we didn't do that? Or should we have done it? That's another, that's another debate. That sounds like a pro. We should have done that. Transfer the risk onto the user. OK. Better for us. OK. I, you're, you're exactly right. What else? Why else wouldn't we have just done debit? It's super quick. We could have been up and running in like 60 days. Venmo didn't have, yeah, yeah, Venmo would transfer money between peers, like you and me, but I'm, a, I'm asking your business. Your business couldn't swipe at Safeway or whatever, Costco on a Venmo card, right? Does that make sense? But it, you're not too far off, though. How do businesses operate? Do they use debit cards? They use credit cards. So yes, it was easier for us to do a debit card. And there were a bunch of people that had built businesses trying to do debit card. But we knew that the customer wouldn't care. The customer would just look at us and be like, well, Chase gives us a credit card. Amex gives us a credit card. Well, yeah, yeah, but we have better software. It's like, yeah, 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 but like, I want cash flow. And we knew that we couldn't be successful unless we said it had credit, it has to be real time, and it has to be all in. Have you guys, uh, Neil and Scale It is the book that you're having them read? So like, a lot of the, there's a lot of methodology out of San Francisco that would say like nibble first and then run, which I do agree with, but I'm going to counteract that. We knew what we were doing. We couldn't do that because we would just get swallowed up. For us, it was about going, uh, going all in. We knew if we were going to woo a customer, we needed to be uh, real time, et cetera. Okay. Uh, we're going to go, we have how much longer? Okay, 15 minutes. Okay, let's go to... Does anyone recognize any of these three people? <coughs> Josh James. Who's Josh James, just for everyone? CEO of, CEO of Domo. Okay, who's the guy on the right? The crazy guy in a purple suit, that's accurate. Who's the guy on the left? An NFL player uh, that for some reason came and worked for us for free for a day. My, this picture is to show this story, right? Even though we had funds, we didn't have funds for Silicon Slopes at the time. So it was like, well, we want to be there, but we didn't have $20,000 to write the check and be there. So we literally, this guy said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put dollar bills all over my suit, and I'm going to go give out $2 bills and cookies and see if people talk to us. So imagine this crowd, but you know, a lot bigger at Silicon Slopes. And we were just outside those doors with our shirts on saying, like, well, when they come, let's just, let's just start going. What ended up happening is one of our old employee, or one of our current employees had worked for Josh at a prior company, recognized him when he came out, grabbed him, said, hey, let me show you Divi. He saw me, he said, let me bring in Alex. I gave Josh a 30 second on my phone demo. And it's the equivalent of like, imagine if you hopped into an elevator and you're looking for a ton of money and Bill Gates happens to be in the elevator and it's literally you have an elevator pitch. And that was what we, that was our opportunity. 
and there's people going around, and it's super loud, and I can tell Josh didn't really want to be stopped, but he goes, all right, 30 seconds, let's go. I break out my phone, showing him, and I'm like, this is what Dippy does. And fortunately, he said, what's your phone number? Gave him my phone number, texted me, and later that day, we had three VC pitches, and that kind of began a lot of our climb to creating momentum and going uh, where we're at. All came from the ability to just say, well, let's do it the unconventional way. We don't have the resources. This is what it means to be a startup. This is where you start with no money. Well, fine, we had like $1,000 for cookies and some $1 bills, but you know, not, not endless fun. Uh, okay. All right. Um, we're gonna do a choose your own adventure with the last few minutes. So we've got three options. How did Divi scale so quickly? Door number one. When's the best time for a company to raise money? Door number two. And should I start my own business? Door number three. So who wants uh, to go down, go down door number one? Decent. Door number two? Door number three? Door number one feels like it won, yeah? yeah. Um, okay. Hold on. All right. Here's, I don't know if this analogy is perfect, but this is my analogy. I'm gonna run with it. Maddie, our PR person in the crowd, says I'm allowed to use it and it's decent, so here we go. Here's my best advice to you guys. Get in the car with a car driver. Here's what I mean. Our, one of our best strategies, the reason we've scaled so fast, is we say something like this to ourselves. We wanna to get to 100 million in revenue, okay? How do we get to 100 million in revenue? Who else has gotten to 100 million in revenue? Domo, Qualtrics, uh, uh, Jive, we listed off the companies. We said, okay, well, we can't go get the number one. We don't have the funds. Who was number two or number three? And we'd go find that number two or number three, and we'd say, at the last company, you saw it. You were in the car, but you didn't have the car keys. Come drive with us. That was our pitch. So come get in the, you know, you were in the car at Jive or at Domo or at Qualtrics. You know what happened, needs to happen. But now you can come drive the car. So they would come to us and they knew the playbook. It wasn't like they had to make it up. They didn't have to learn it. They would come, they had their playbook, they'd put the playbook down and we'd start executing against the playbook. And it's worked really, really well for us. Because to scale, you can't be learning on the fly. Let me give you a good example. I couldn't have scaled Divi like our employees that, that we hired to come scale Divi. They had the skill set. I hadn't seen it to that extent. I've been doing other stuff, which again, I'm proud of, but it wasn't that skill set. So we went and hired people and said, you were in the car, come drive with us, it worked. Now, what that means to you guys, uh, so I have nephews and nieces and, and friends that are you know, in college and, and leaving, and my advice to them is find car drivers and sit right next to them. Be an intern, uh, work at whatever company you can. You'll find people, it could be a smaller company, it could be a bigger company, but find someone that you would refer to as a mentor, but it's someone who's like, they're good. They're driving their car. They're making stuff happen. They have a P&L, they always hit numbers. You recognize car drivers when you see them and all you need to do is just go sit next to them. So my nephew Camden works at Divi. Uh, he didn't get paid at first, so we said, sure, I can get you a job for free. You can come to Divi for free. Uh, he, he gets paid now, but he sits right next to a guy named Jaron and right next to another guy named Sterling. Both of those guys are car drivers and I tell them every day, all you gotta do, do whatever they ask. Ask them what they're doing to prepare for the board meeting. Ask them how they manage their week. Ask them how they manage their day. Watch what they do, and if you, if you impress them and do what they do, you'll be driving your car way sooner than you ever thought. And frankly, that, that was some of my luck in, in school didn't come because I was smart at school. It's because I found car drivers and I just did whatever they asked. That also means I got paid a lot less in my 20s. I, took, I quit a job working for a CBS affiliate, won't go into the whole thing. I came into the boss and I said, look, I quit. And she goes, where are you going? And I go, I just know I can't be here. I've gotta go, I've gotta go. I didn't tell her, but I'm like, I've gotta go find car drivers. And for me, it's impacted my life, changed my tra the trajectory of, of, uh, of my business career. So that'd be my biggest advice. Any questions on the car driver theory? Did you guys like it? Is that good? You're allowed to say no, you're not friends with me. You like don't have to feel like, you know, the incentive. Hey, the two in the back, let's go there first and we'll go there and then I'll, I'll come to you. Yeah, you. So fortunately for me, I have older brothers I, I, th who are successful and I looked at their friends and, and basically just started to network with them. But 
the other routes, I would go to networking events, I'd find companies that are successful, and I would just start taking people to lunch. In college, we, meaning people in the business world, will take you to lunch. You're in school, we're trying to help you, we're trying to learn, like you're trying to learn, so we're like happy to give our advice. The second you come out of school and you're selling something, now you want a job. Now you want to sell me something. And it's a, it's a little bit more difficult to get in front of a guy like Scott Peterson when you're potentially looking for that favor, but when you're young and hungry, a, a lot of doors will open up. So I'd, I'd check out LinkedIn, I'd look at your networks, I'd look at people that you know that are close to you that are older, and then, then go sideways, see where they're at. Does that answer or do you want a better one? I can come up with another one. Oh, we gave them equity. Yeah. In theory, everyone gets equity at Divi, but it is a, dis it is a discussion how much equity you get. Uh, so we have an X percent uh, of our pool that we, we give to our um, employees. But yeah, the people that we say come drive a car, sometimes it's not equity. Sometimes they just want to drive the car. So, man, I saw this other guy run the sales team, and like I would do things so much differently than that guy. Well, great. Come do those things. So like now's your chance. Come, come over here. So a lot, sometimes it's equity, but I think more often than not, there's hard equity and there's soft equity. And I think people drastically undervalue the power of soft equity, both in their career, as well as in bringing people to your, to your company. Respect, uh, validation, opportunity. Hey, come join my team, you're gonna be on our board. You're gonna come to the board meetings and then go to investor pitches. You didn't get that opportunity at your last company, but I know that's what you want, come do it with us. It's the same pay. You're probably still gonna come, right? So stuff like that. Yeah. Well, not a lot of car drivers, sorry. That's probably the, the, what I changed. We didn't go hire 300 car drivers. And by the way, car drivers aren't the only people to hire at businesses. There are so many different roles that have a ton of value. Uh, Scott Peterson's son works at Divi. He's not currently a car driver, which is totally fine. He's, a creative, uh, he's in our creative and arts team. He's super talented. He's younger but he's working with Mike Moulton, who is a car driver, he's super talented. So he knows that he's learning, and he's hoping at some point to get the opportunity at Divi, and if he doesn't, he'll go somewhere else and become a car driver there, and that's what I want for him, right? So not everyone that comes to Divi is gonna have every wish fulfilled at Divi, it's pretty difficult to do everyone, but you wanna build up their careers and give them the opportunity so that they can go further their success somewhere. And, then the, and while they're at Divi, they're, they're hopefully building up Divi. You mean like a, a board member? Yeah, like you get them to come on board and help out with the team and help learn and help yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, and it didn't always work out. The problem with a lot of consultants, advisors, friends, typically they're people that probably have invested a little bit, like an angel investor, um, is they're not in your business enough to really impact it. So occasionally they can give some pretty good insights, but more often than not, they just don't have enough of the day-to-day -to, -day to truly move a needle. So we've had really helpful people give advice. Um, at the end of the day, I think we've gotten a lot more from people that were like in our business, like listening to my mid-level managers or to our directors that are, you know, they can provide more insight because they're talking to the customers, they're seeing more things than an advisor. But it's still helpful to, to have a, a friend. That's what they should be. Okay, uh, we probably have time for one more real quick one. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. What's up? I'll just tell you my, what I did. That does not mean it's everyone's path for sure. This will kind of go into, should I start my own business, uh, number three, door three. So some people want to come out of school and start a business, which, uh, look, I'm not going to tell you no, because, like, if it's that great of an idea, do it. The problem is when you start it so young, there's probably a lot of skills that you don't have that will probably cause the business to fail, even if it's a good idea. Meaning, I, I would advise going to go somewhere, whether it's Amazon, Deloitte, Google, here, Qualtrics, Domo, Divi, wherever, that can push you and you can learn from other people. Car drivers are not just like learn from talented people. 
understand what you like and don't like at a company, and then you can probably be, I have the skill set to say, okay, now I can go start my company. Um, so I would, I would typically say stay away from just starting a company right out of school, but I don't, you know, if your idea is that great and you're the J-Dog guy and you start selling hot dogs, like congratulations. Um, for me, I, I, school was never my thing. Um, I just was, it just wasn't my thing. So I never got phenomenal grades in high school. Um, I got into BYU because I was good at another thing. And I just realized it wasn't my thing. So I said, I'm gonna, I did geography. I loved it, but it was like the shortest major. That was actually why I started going into it. And I got out of school as fast as I possibly could because I just wanted to go fail. I wanted to go fail. What I mean by that is I think I was with like three or four startups. It wasn't mine. I joined other people and learned a ton in the first two to three years. And that's what I wanted to do. I knew the sooner I got in front of those people and learned how to fail, learned how to win, and learned what I was good at and not good at, that's when I could figure out what my career was going to be. I didn't think sitting in a classroom was going to help me. So that's what I decided to do. But honestly, I know a lot of people are super successful that went through the school route, so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we weren't in the banking industry, but that's where we're, that's who we're competing against, right? Like my competitors are Chase Bank and Wells. Uh, but we came from the business side, right? We were the customer that was going to the banks and saying, well, everything you're offering me just sucks. Like, it's not good. So we came from the customer's perspective to say, let's go reverse engineer this thing. We didn't come from that industry. The problem can be if you go into an industry and say, like, all right, I want to disrupt banking. You go into banking. If you're that good, they start to like, promote you and you get golden handcuffs. You guys know what those are. And they're like hard to take off and then you become a banker for life. So it's, it's like this fine line of being in an industry too long to know it and not enough to disrupt it. Um, for me, you said it, you were the one who talked about the customer, it doesn't resonate with the customer. Anything you launch, it doesn't matter how good the business model is, it doesn't matter like how much you think you know, if that end customer doesn't resonate with it, it's going to fail. So the thing you should learn is how to figure out product market fit, how to find the customer. And I think if you do that, you can start all sorts of stuff. And you can be bad at all sorts of stuff. But if you find product market fit, our head of product has the saying, uh, are the dogs eating the dog food? And what he means is like, hey, there's hair in it. It's gross. It's a couple days old. It's not fresh. It's not like good dog food. But are they eating it? And when you start up a, when you start up a company, it's basically saying, well, of course it's not a polished product. It's not perfect dog food. It's kind of gross. There's hairs in it. It's not perfect. But if they're eating the food, that means you have something that you can get better on. You can, you can perfect that dog food. And that for us has, has been true, right? We had dog food early on, but we've had a lot of hair in it. And we still have hair in it. We're trying to get it better. But that's super impactful as you start a company. Any last questions, 30 seconds or less? Yeah. You said earlier just that you knew the goal was to go help the bank fix the yeah. process. Yeah. Where are you guys at now in that fix the process? Like, what's the next kind of line you're in? Uh, we hopefully will hit that this, at the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. So don't cheer too loud. Uh, no, hopefully. We, 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 this is my last thing. First off, this is my pitch for you to come to Divi. We think we have the chance to be the biggest company to ever come out of Utah. We think we can be a hundred billion or more company. We are taking on Amex, Chase, Wells, every big boy. These are trillion dollar markets. And right now we're getting there, we're nibbling at their feet. We're obviously not there, but like they're starting to pay attention. So we are very excited about the swing we're taking. It might not work, but we are very, very confident that like they're eating the dog food. And if we do it correctly, that there's a ton of opportunity in front of us. So we hopefully hit it this year and on to more things in the next. So, hey, thanks everyone. Appreciate it.